So it's been 12 years since I filmed the pilot for the Fully Charged Show, and now we're on the cusp of a million YouTube subscribers. We also have a second YouTube channel, the Everything Electric Show. Half a dozen live events around the world, and in 2023, we are hosting the first Fully Charged Awards. But I have to confess that one of my favourite things is the Fully Charged podcast. I love doing that. Every Monday, almost without fail, you get to hear me talk to amazing experts from across the Fully Charged cosmos of clean energy and transport. But one thing I've always wanted to do is to film these interviews in front of a small, high-quality audience, which we have here today. <laughs> Listen to that. Lovely, lovely people who are so happy to be here, even though technically it is their job. Because yeah. <laughs> our audience is made up entirely of people who work on The Fully Charged Show. And they're all absolutely gorgeous. I'll just tell you that much. What you're going to witness is a pilot for our new Fully Charged Friends video podcast series that will roll out from next April. And one more very important point. At the end of this show, we will be launching an actual competition with actual prizes. So we sincerely hope you enjoy it. Welcome to The Fully Charged Podcast. Welcome to you guys. So Imogen, you've been up to, you, you've both been up to a lot. I mean, I've basically been at home writing news stories and getting them all wrong. You've been actually out and about doing actual proper filming. Yeah, so we yesterday um, went up to Newcastle to see the interconnector. If you're not <laughs> familiar with what an interconnector is, it is basically a big, massive wire that runs from Norway to the UK so that you can swap renewable energy between right. Norway and the UK. Right. And it was really, really cool. And can you actually see a wire? Can you actually see it? Like, can yeah. you see it? It so, kind of comes out of the ground somewhere. We went up onto the roof and it's very chilly, but it was very, very beautiful. And you can see it's almost like an ap apocalyptic scene. You can see the sort of two lines as the wires come in under the ground. And then you go to the building below and it pops out out of the ground. Wow. And you're like, at the other end of that cable is Norway. It's in Norway. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, so it was really cool. Yeah. I mean, we wore a lot of PPE. Yes. It wasn't necessarily my size. No. But I think, you know, it looks <laughs> pretty good. There is a fantastic <laughs> photograph. We have to use that somewhere of all of you standing in your PPE. And actually, I mean, three of you, look, Andy, cameraman, uh, uh, um, Helen, looks kind of like they're wearing clothes that vaguely fit them. <laughs> and at the end is you, just, it's a comical look. I'm sorry, Imogen. Well, I was so <laughs> excited to be there as well. So I've got this stupid grin on my face, wearing enormous PPE. So it sort of looks like the, you know, bring your child to work day. Yeah, but it's very sweet. Worth it. Yeah, so. and Dan, where have you been? Well, uh, Imogen went to the northeast. I went a bit further, actually. Mm -hmm. No competition. I went to Edinburgh to see the launch of the new Munro EV, ah. which I think you're going to like, Robert. We'll film with it next year. It's yeah. kind of like an um, electric, sort of rugged Land Rover Defender uh, replacement, uh, just launched by a small company uh, in Glasgow. Uh, it's got a 1,000 a uh, kilogram uh, payload, and I think it can tow 3,500 kilograms. It can go for 16 hours uh, off-road, Right. Uh, all duty. It's an incredible uh, looking thing, but I'm kind of was more interested in what it represents, really, which is perhaps a rebirth of some automotive manufacturing in oh, Scotland. Being happen, actually making cars here. Mm. Yeah. Um, and also, it's actually designed to last for 50 years. Wow. And I think that's not an often talked about thing about electric cars. No. Actually, they can last a lot longer than combustion engine vehicles. Yeah. And so could one, one sale replace two vehicles so yeah. it was a you know, fascinating launch and i think we'll be covering that in a suitably wet and dirty environment in uh, early in 2023 right now imogen you're of that generation that may well, i'm sure you haven't you wouldn't but uh, have used a dating app where you do i don't even know what it is where you do something you swipe well right yes well but then but there's this new thing it's quite weird i don't understand it i need it explained okay so you might have heard of tinder i have you might have heard of bumble no. <laughs> Uh, have you heard of Grinder, Robert? I've heard of Grinder. Okay, okay, All my okay. best mates are on Grinder. <laughs> yeah. Well, Optimus Energy have made something called Winder. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Which ostensibly is the same thing as Tinder, but it's identifying areas or people that would like to have onshore wind 
You're in their local area. Oh, wow. Um, and okay. that is obviously in response to the fact that the government has said, OK, we're going to yeah. try and lift some restrictions on onshore wind. Um, and they've identified 2.3 gigawatts of potential new British onshore wind energy uh, because of Winder. Because of Winder. Wow, yeah. it happens above. That's extraordinary. I mean, I think we should just explain that a bit, that it's the UK government. Yes, has yes. Just, uh, which banned like, uh, outright any development, of, well, except there have been some onshore wind mm. farms that built, but very, very few. It's very, very restricted. Offshore, it's going, going crazy. But onshore is bad. And they've just sort of rescinded that, only like yesterday or the day before, yeah. they rescinded that ruling. So that there, it is now possible in this country to uh, install new onshore wind, which is without doubt and without question, and everybody says it doesn't matter what field they're from, the cheapest form of renewable energy, the cheapest form of electricity you can possibly produce is onshore wind. Exactly. And I think, you know, the big contentious bit has been, oh, but people don't want it in there, like yeah. not in my backyard kind of feeling. And then Octopus Energy have been like, aha, we have a solution. Yeah. Winder, that's how we'll find these areas. And lo and behold, they found a, a big chunk of it. Because I would love it literally yeah. in my backyard. I would <laughs> love to have a really massive wind turbine in my backyard, but I probably would find burning crosses on my lawn the next mm. day. <laughs> that makes some of your neighbours a bit. Yeah, a I don't know. Fun. They might not. They but they're like, vroom, yeah. Vroom. yeah, yeah. And Dan, oh, yes. tell me something that you're up to. <laughs> Uh, well, one of the things we're doing at the moment is looking for more content for the second channel, the yes. Everything Electric Show, the yeah. home of home energy. Um, and we'll be covering more stuff than home energy in, in due course, but we're starting off with lots of home energy episodes. So we're having fun researching lots of properties with, with heat pumps. Yeah. Uh, other electrification of heat technologies are available as well. And one, one we've stumbled across recently, which we're looking at to uh, cover, is called Heater. Oh, that, I have Heater with an A yeah. on the end. Um, <laughs> And you're probably aware that you know, the, the, the airline industry is responsible for a, a lot of carbon emissions, but you're probably less aware that actually the cloud computing uh, Which is responsible dependent of on, on the is, re is responsible yeah. for, for, for pretty much a, as much sort of uh, emissions as the, as the airline wow, industry. Okay. But because it's called in the cloud, yeah. obviously people kind of uh, forget about it. But the reality is it's on land, it's data centers, and they consume an awful lot of power. Yeah and data centers and computers get extremely hot. So there was a company from France a few years ago that actually would basically um, would, uh, compute uh, data in your ha home in a radiator, and the radiator would get, right. get hot, yeah. but it was effectively a, a data device. But unfortunately, radiators aren't needed all year round, so it wasn't probably the best fit right. in terms of complementarity of energy when you required it. So what Heater have done is they've created a computational device that gets hot, and they basically have a thermal bridge which attacks, attaches it to uh, a hot water tank. Wow. So and you're so heating your water, which you're heating you need your, heated all heating year round. Heating your water, yeah. uh, and actually you're effectively, as, as a consumer, as a... Oh, I shouldn't say that. I'm not allowed to say consumer. As a person, <laughs> as a, person. As a human, as a homeowner, yeah. you're effectively getting free uh, hot water, which is right. fantastic. But it, what it also means is you can distribute that data and you yeah. can distribute that through the, the a number of different well. houses. So there's, there's trials starting next year. So we hope to be, be able to cover heater oh, in fantastic. 2023. But just one quick question. Presumably, if you f have this fitted, it's going to be using electricity. D does that get compensated for in some way? Because you are still paying for the electricity to run the run the device ladies and gentlemen we i have know. no idea <laughs> but next year we will that. ask that question for sure and that is why we're going to cover them on the exactly, show exactly those hard-hitting questions i had another question i just remember what i've been doing because <laughs> i was thinking oh i haven't filmed anything yes i have because i've done the the air permeability test which was absolute a real eye-opener so it's not a new thing but we've done a show about air permeability where you suck air out of a house and then you walk around and you just, you, I mean, you, they do use tools and sophisticated com computational things. But actually, you just walk up to a wall and you go, there's cold air, particularly this time of year when it's cold. I could not believe, we could hardly shut one door because so much wind was coming through the house. And all the doors, all the external oh doors God. were shut. But the, the wind coming through, the cold wind in this, you know, in this house was, and you go, that is terrible how, yeah. how badly sealed our houses are this is nothing to do with insulation this house is actually very well insulated modern house doesn't have leaks it but there are like there was a hole in a wall where there had been an external light and it's now on the interior they've extended the building you put your hand next to that and there's a, like a high speed air conditioning blast of cold air coming out of that hole it's not coming from out, out for, it's not coming through through the wall that wall is an internal wall it's coming from up in the roof space 
It, you know, it's these amazing things they discover. And the, the loft hatch at the top of, you know, up into your attic, that was like an icy blast coming out of that. But the roof is insulated. So it was a well-insulated house. It's, it, so it was a real eye-opener. I was thinking, you've just got to walk around your house and go, that's cold air coming in there. It makes it, it's the cheapest, lowest hanging fruit of energy efficiency in a house. You know, it's the, it is the first thing you should do. Because I always say the first thing you should do is insulate. Now, the first thing you should do is suck air out of your house and see what yeah. happens, because you'll be staggered. I kind of have visions of you being the sort of like my spidey senses <laughs> against the walls. You, know? you didn't really need the spidey senses. Your, hand, your hands got cold. When we were under the loft, that side of my head was frozen. That wasn't. That was warm because it was coming down that side. It was extraordinary. So that was a really, it was a really good episode, really worth watching. So that is coming, that is going to be out before Christmas. So oh, not before, because I was worried it was going to come out before this goes out, but it isn't it's coming out before Christmas. Yeah. Air permeability. It's a new term I like. AP. <laughs> <laughs> What's your AP rating? <laughs> and now we've got a special guest. Imogen, can you introduce the special guest? Yes, because uh, she does deserve a proper... She does. ...proper introduction. So True. we are joined by, frankly, a slightly intimidatingly impressive clean energy pioneer. Juliet Davenport is the former CEO of Good Energy, which she founded in 1999. And from 2002, it was the first 100% renewable energy provider. And as if that wasn't enough, just a couple of months ago, she published The Green Startup, which brings together this extensive experience to take founders and businesses through their journey of making organizations greener and better for the planet across their whole pipeline from bricks and mortar to culture to delivery and more. And the advice contained within, and this is a quote, will serendipitously also help you save money while saving the planet. So welcome, Juliet. Welcome to you. Hi, it's so good to see Whoops. you. We're all going to have to. Whoa, there we go. There we go. There we go. In. It's very comfy now. Uh, how are you? Are you, are you, are you I'm good, actually. Okay. I'm really good. I'm doing loads of different things yeah. and really excited just to find out about new projects, new technologies. Yeah, Fantastic. good times. Wow. And you've been very busy with a book as well. Yes, yes. That was quite hard, actually, trying to sort of think of things that would be interesting rather than just writing, writing out what I did, actually going in and finding new things and making things click. So it took a while, and then I had to read it out. You had to read it out. So the audio book, is, is oh. the audio book available now? It is available. Oh, Hopefully it's that. not too bad. Somebody said they were listening to me on 1.4 times. <laughs> not sure what that means. Is a that good? A bit faster. Bad? Yeah. I don't think it's bad. A lot of people do that. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I would interpret that as they, you know, they're just so desperate to get through it as quickly oh, yes. as they can. So exciting. <laughs> I love that image, and I'll keep that. <laughs> But that is amazing to think back, you know, I, I, I can't remember when we first met, but uh, your good energy was well established when we first came to see you yeah, in, uh, down in your was. offices. But so 1999 is when you actually founded the company. Is that when it started? Yeah, that's when we got a license eventually right. from the regulator. Right. Because um, that, that was a big thing. I do remember hearing about that at the time. Yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it was hilarious because we'd, um, we'd gone to the regulator, asked for a license, and then they said, well, you need to prove that you've, been, you've got audited accounts and everything. But, and I kept going, but we're a startup. So, of course, yeah. we haven't got audited accounts. We, don't, we didn't exist yeah. last week. Um, and so we had this ridiculous conversation with the regulator, and eventually we got our license. It was very exciting, but slightly terrifying. Yeah. But then the, the growth of it was extraordinary. I mean, that, you know, how, how and the, the impact it made. I mean, I think, you know, because there yeah. were, there were yeah. I, think, I always think of you as the original one. There's certain other companies <laughs> that have had quite a lot of publicity, which we won't mention now. But, you know, that became, that sort of appeared. Definitely. I mean, when we started, there was 2% renewables in the mix. Right. Um, you'd walk into a room and if you talked about renewables, if you talked at all, to be honest, yeah. everybody thought you were either slightly odd or who are they? Who is she particularly? Because I tended to be the only female as right. well. And, and so it was, it was an odd time yeah. um, and nobody believed in it. Everybody slightly poo-pooed it. In fact, we originally funded ourselves through a crowdfund because nobody in the city would back us. Wow. Um, because, because genuinely nobody believed in renewables. And that is a really important point. So 2% of our electricity in the UK was from yeah. renewables when you yeah. started. And what is the, I don't know what the accepted uh, figure is now, but it's... 
I mean, I think last year was about 40, 45 percent. Right. It's over that now and, and gaining momentum. Yeah. On the subject of approvals, though, it took you quite a long time. And we've just heard news that something else has been approved in the UK. Some, yeah. some bad energy, you might call it, as opposed <laughs> to good energy. We are now going from good energy to stinking bad energy. What are yeah. your thoughts on that? I, mean, I just think it's a political kind of knee jerk reaction to what's going on in Ukraine. Um, I, I mean, I don't know where they're going to burn it, to be honest. Um, yeah. How many coal power stations are still operating? Well, it's kind of technically none, but occasionally they do turn on one or two. Drax B, I think, still can burn coal, a big yeah. one. I mean, I think just to explain to our audience that uh, the, the UK government have just approved the, the West Cumbria Mining Company to open a new, in 2022, coal mine in the UK, which is really... Yeah, I bet all the local residents are really happy about well, that I think one. They, they might be because they think it's wonderful job security. In there, and I can understand that because it's an area of, of you know, economic deprivation, which has yeah. been ignored by the current government for the last 12 years. They have been in power for 12 years. I'm sorry, I'm just saying that. 12 years. But I think it's also worth mentioning that we, I think we probably all would have got the BBC News alert yesterday. Yeah. Uh, when this, you know, this news was announced and all had the like, what? What is this? And then I think the response from... Steel manufacturers has been brilliant of like, yeah. we don't want this either. That's what are you doing? <laughs> That's so, I mean, that was such, because the big sales pitch, I mean, I've been aware of this coming for a long time. I'm sure you have as well. But the big sales pitch was it's to make, it's not to burn, burn to make electricity, it's to burn to make steel. And you yeah. go, well, okay, I suppose, you know, people <laughs> who actually run the actual steel work saying, we don't want this coal, it's rubbish. Yeah, it sounds I mean, like. So, so bad. Some conversations behind closed doors yeah. that nobody else has been privy to. I mean, no, we, live, we live in an era of, um, sorry, we live in an era of protest, don't we? And, and we can see more and more of that coming. Maybe Just Stop Oil should rebrand to Just Stop Coal for a day or something. I don't know. But also <laughs> Extinction Rebellion and things like that. I mean, it's so polarised now, the debate, isn't yeah. it? But the UK does seem to be a bit of an outlier with, certainly with coal. Yeah, definitely. And I, and I think it's interesting because nothing really, despite the fact we're trying to outlaw protesters, nothing ever tends to happen in this country unless you get protesters because government doesn't take people seriously no, enough otherwise. No. I mean, business can have an impact. And obviously, the brilliant Fully Charged show can have an impact too. It's very tiny. Because <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was another one that I got, I, you know, the normal sort of interaction. I think it was on YouTube comments about, you know, well, 60% of all the world's energy is still produced by fossil fuel. You can't denigrate fossil fuels. They've changed. You know, and it's absolutely true. We, we live in a world that's been built on fossil fuels, absolutely. But it's, and they go, 60%. You go, yeah, that is a lot. When you started Good Energy, it was 85%. Yeah. Yeah. globally you know yeah. so it has changed enormously in that time and you also have to watch out that they don't use the wrong stats oh well, yeah because if they use million tons of oil equivalent right then renewables get under under undersold in terms of the total amount right. so the data even the way the data is put out there is still it's, skewed it's, towards it's skewed. the fossil world yeah yeah so nerd alert okay <laughs> i have asked for christmas for a book called bad data which emphasizes all of those points. It's like, how do people use data to tell a particular story yeah, that they completely. want to tell? Um, but I think, I think it's really interesting that, you know, you started Good Energy at a point 2% renewables. It's now whatever stat we want to use, but substantially more. Um, we've now got the situation of a really, really polarized debate. And I feel like your approach has been very pragmatic, be in the room, influence policy. And I wondered if you had any, any sort of reflections. And I guess guidance on the best way to engage in the debates that we're seeing. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the point, my experience of government, I remember going to see a government minister quite early on in, in when I was running good. And um, we were, I was chatting to him about renewables. He was meant to be a big renewables fan. And um, he, he was, I don't know why he was telling me this, but he was telling me how excited he was because he was going out to dinner with the CEO of British Gas. I was going, really? Does that really make your day? Um, and I think this has always been the problem is that sort of um, uh, senior, senior people in government, whether it's politicians or civil servants, are impressed by big business. They always have been. And, and so when big business goes in and says, we want this or we think this, OK, they, they do resist to a certain extent. But there's always there's always this backdoor conversation that's going on. And so if you're an innovative technology, if you're a new company, if you're trying to make a difference, You've got to be cleverer than to be able to cut through. And I think, I think by the end of good, we got a bit of a formula going. So go and get some piece of research done. Get some a great university to say this is this 
stand stacks up. Go and find some advocates, people whether they're in the campaigning world or or sort of the media world who think who agree with you. Create a campaign that's going to create lots of news stories because actually government does respond to that. Yeah. So yeah. so so the media is incredibly powerful um, and continually putting these things out there, they will pay attention. But yeah. can you overcome money? So for example, the UK Party Conference uh, in. September, October was dominated by hydrogen lobbyists going to the Conservative Party yeah. conference, the Labour Party conference, just simply because they have more money at their disposal than maybe smaller startups and scale ups in the renewable uh, sector. How can you combat that? I think the only way you can combat that is through social. Um, because you can't be there. If you're running a small company, you don't have the time to go and sit at all these, and, I, and actually necessarily the inclination to go to a bunch <laughs> of party conferences, sorry. Um, but, but you can take on social media, and if you get a decent amount of filing, a million, it's doing pretty well, yeah. um, then, then people do st start to take a look. And they then look at what you're producing. Thought leadership work, really powerful in this world. Because, I mean, that was the other thing. I mean, we, we discussed this before. We mentioned it on the show before. The, the, the most recent COP was the, the highest number of fossil fuel yeah. uh, facilitators, I think they're now called, because they were, <laughs> they were facilitating... We're, we're facilitating to, more fossil fuel? Yeah, well, they're there to facilitate uh, the conversation. The I think that was the official term. <laughs> That's the word with F you're allowed to use. Yes. <laughs> That's the F word. But I mean, it is, it is an, you know, I wonder how many lobbyists there were for renewable energy companies. Probably none or one or two. Well, they were probably out building stuff. They were actually making something, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. that's, yeah. I mean, if you look at the massive growth out there, renewables are out there growing as fast as they possibly can. Nearly, I think it's, I looked at a stat the other day, 65 million people employed in the energy sector worldwide. Right. That's quite a lot. Oh, that's uh, a lot nearly 50% of them now in the clean energy sector. Wow. So that's a massive shift yeah. over the last 20 years. And imagine if West Cumbria Council had, uh, <laughs> had, had installed a, a massive factory that makes wind turbines, makes something, you know, water, there's, yeah. tidal, there's a lot of tidal stuff in, uh, in that area. They've got an amazing tidal... Tidal range, uh, yeah, tidal they range. will have, yeah. yeah. But I think that, that brings me on to another question because, you know, there are so many potential jobs in clean energy. And if, if you have, speaking to teenagers now, you'd be like, get yourself a job in a clean technology, you will have a job for life. And it means that there's this sort of blurring of worlds between what's a very sensible, pragmatic, sensible thing to do and things that are sort of true to your values from an environmental perspective. And I'm going to read this quote from your book, if that's all right. <laughs> okay. Um, you said... Read it well, Imogen. I will try my very best. <laughs> read it better than <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it won't be on a 1.4. Um, <laughs> Throughout my business career, I've learned often through painful trial and error how fraught with complexity it can be when values collide with realities. I wanted to shine a light on the issues that eco-entrepreneurs and founders wrestle with every single day. Yeah. And I'm curious that like, there is presumably this world or this possibility that realities and values can become much more closely entangled. And has that changed, do you think, in... Of yeah, I think I think was one of the things that was really interesting, and and the thought that provoked that book, part of the book, is when you when you get the first people into a company, um, you're all in it together. You're all super excited about what you're trying to achieve and who you are, and and you you tend to share values. And as you grow bigger, that becomes harder because obviously you're bringing people in, and what what you tend to find is you. Um, and, and I definitely did this over time at Good, is I brought people in who had capability over values. And what that meant is that they then come in, so say they were a finance director, for example, they go, oh, why are we doing all this green stuff? Right. Because that costs us more. <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah. like, yeah, but that's the fundamental reason why it exists. So there were some conversations like that that were, were, that, that were I was just like slightly eye rolling. It's like, oh my God, seriously? Um, sorry. Um, and uh, so, so all those all those pieces. It was a really interesting journey because I think as much changing the way we operate or changing bringing new technologies in or anything is as much a cultural change as it is a business or as it is a technological change. And it's about how we use these technologies and how we embrace them, but also why we're doing it. Mm. Um, and that is the big piece that that I see time and time again. And you can immediately see it. I was at the Sky Awards yesterday um, judging some brilliant adverts for sort of changing the planet, a, a, bunch of, a bunch of retail goods. And it was fascinating standing up, watching people who have sustainability at the core of who they are. You can see it. It's absolutely genuine. 
the people who've added it to make the story work it's fascinating to watch it just doesn't it's it's good but it doesn't quite ring true and i think it, those companies who have it who who everybody engages with it from a purpose point of view can move so much faster as a result i mean i think that's a critically important skill that i think people are there's a lot more people developing it is is seeing through greenwashing Yes. You know, that I think 10 years ago, we were, I was bamboozled. I go, BP are going to change the world. <laughs> and I go, oh, that's good. You know, now I go, no, you're not. <laughs> you spent 20 quid on renewables and 200 billion on searching for new oil and gas. Yeah, and but then you've got some nice pictures. But you've got yeah. some lovely pictures of a child running through a field of corn. Yes. Uh, but do you yeah. see institutional money moving in the right direction now? Because, I mean, the, the reality is when you're, when you're talking about any of this... It, that's a super important driver, right? Yeah, no, completely. I mean, one of, one of the organisations I work with is uh, an investment trust which um, funds when you, uh, uh, rooftop solar on commercial buildings. And when we went out to raise money uh, last year, I think it was, we raised nearly double, nearly triple the amount that we were looking for. So I think wow. there, is, there is a lot of money looking for places to go. Um, I think there's some nervousness about can I trust those places? So are they really green? How are we checking the credentials? Because I think a lot of financiers are worried that they'll invest all their money, they'll put all their credentials against their environmental, social and governance credentials. And then suddenly there'll be a bad news story because this, this, this project won't be as green as they thought it was. So in your sort of auditing process, what's your kind of like top three things to look out for to avoid potential greenwashing? Oh, that's really interesting. I mean, I think it depends what it is, but um, fundamentally, uh, so if you are a company that has a product, um, then you need to have tested every single aspect of that project product. So sort of what is it? What does it do? Can you verify that? Where does it come from? How do you make it? What's your supply chain look like? Who are the people who make it? Um, and then where does your investment come to make it? So I think there's a, there's a kind of hierarchy that you can look through and then just be honest about it. But if you're looking at other people's greenwashing, anything that seems too good to be true, to be honest. <laughs> Probably is. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, sort of price, price is always an interesting part because I think as time goes on, price and sustainability will align more and we're beginning to see that a bit. But, but claiming it's the cheapest and it's the greenest at the moment for me is, is always just a red flag to go, well, maybe I should check that. Yeah. Because, I mean, that's something that I've certainly personally experienced in the last 12 years doing this show is the potential uh, uh, new, new uh, generally cars. The amount of car companies I've been to see, startup car companies, I can't remember what they're called now because they've disappeared completely and they didn't work. You know, and that's become a really important thing for me to go, it's amazing what this company are doing, what they plan to do, but will they? it's incredibly difficult to get that from. Yes. You know, and Tesla, and I guess now we can say Rivian, two companies that have gone from, you know, an idea to an actual company that produces yeah. actual machines that actually are on the road. That, but presumably I've missed hundreds of renewable energy startup potential idea, battery storage, different solar wind turbines that go that way instead of that way. <laughs> All that stuff. You yeah. know, there's been a lot of it. I'm, yeah, uh, and, and that's what, one of the people I interviewed in the book. One of the things he said, if you're going to have impact, you actually need to be good at what you're doing. Yeah. So make sure you can run a company before you decide to run a company with purpose. Right. Mm. Yes. <laughs> That's a good point. Though. I was going to say, what, I was going to say, do you have any advice? We're we're a green startup. Do you have any advice for for us? You know, we've been doing it a little while, but you've been well, you doing, did, it. doing it. You, I think you guys know what you're doing. I mean, I, I for any startup or Thank any you, company, yeah, totally. understanding who you are, I think, is the first thing, and then exploring. Uh, for me, if you're going to look at the whole greenness, exploring where you have impact. So you have impact probably at every single decision you make. So the places you decide to go. Uh, how where, we get there? How you get thing, there? Big debate at the um, it's sort of where, how you hire your people, who you hire, yeah. how you market, um, whether how you go out to market, um, and also, I mean, where you. I, I'm guessing everybody here is employed. They probably have a pension. Where that pension is invested, all those things, everywhere yeah. in a business, you have an impact. Oh 
Um, and it's and it's really there's a brilliant company that we worked with really early on at Good called Leap who make who did paper printing. Yes, they do amazing. They did all the research on inks and paper, extraordinary. And they were tiny, and we commissioned them to do some work with us. As a result of the back of our commissioning, so we may not have had a massive impact because we commissioned them, but they then went on to work for National Trust, which then had a much bigger impact. So. The companies that you choose to work with can also then go on and work with other organisations too because of you. And how do you stay positive? Because I did a keynote the other day and I had to be really positive in front of an audience. And and by the time I did the keynote, I was. But beforehand, I was thinking, I don't feel that positive today. You know, there were bad news like the Cumbrian coal mine. Do you feel optimistic still? Because there's some... There's lots of good news, but there's also lots of uncertainty and volatility and there's bad yeah. actors trying to spin the debate in, in, in the negative direction. So how, how do you feel about the next five to 10 years? Yeah, so I, I, guess, I guess fundamentally, I do believe that renewables and, and a lot of these new technologies work really well. They're going to be cheaper. They're going to be better. Um, and as a result... Actually, that will work its way through eventually. So you'll get the pretenders. You'll get the sort of people in the way. Um, But I also believe that the more... I mean, the fact that we've had a Tory backbench rebellion to bring on onshore wind farms. Onshore wind, extraordinary. I mean, come on, 10 years ago. You wouldn't dream of it. No, exactly. So I I think, for me, I think... Maybe I'm an ultimate pragmatist. I think people will see that this is so... so, Electric cars, they're bloody amazing, aren't they? Um, Why wouldn't you want one? except for the wing mirrors this morning on mine. Other than that, why wouldn't you Well, that's one? because Elon's focused on Twitter, though, at the moment, rather than your... Yes, on my right. wing mirrors. Focus on your damn wing mirrors. When it's frozen in the morning, <laughs> yeah. please. Thank you very much. Um, but yes, yeah, so I think, I think I believe that it is sensible. And eventually we do do sensible things. Yeah. And burning loads of coal is not sensible. Yeah. And therefore we're going to stop it. Yeah. So I guess that's why I stay optimistic. Because it makes good business sense. Makes, well, that means the argument I now use in public is, you know, people go, well, I don't know that I agree with all these battery cars. And I go, it's fine. <laughs> don't agree with them. Don't have anything to do with it. Eventually, in tw- 10 years' time, you'll buy a second-hand car and it'll be electric. You won't even think about it. Yeah. It's like the argument's over as far as I'm concerned. You know, importing f- liquid fuel from a yeah. possibly hostile nation, refining it here using loads of electricity and burning it once in a car is just stupid. Yes, and we no, need completely. To stop doing it. I mean, yeah. for those of you who might remember Dad's Army, do you remember the first opening scene of Dad's no, Army? I do. You won't remember. And you got, I don't remember. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think I was about the same age as the actors in Dad's Army. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there's all those little arrows. Do you remember when there's a sort of, yeah, and when, it, it's a yeah. sort of coming back? Who do, that's, you, who do you think you are kidding? Yes, Hitler? yeah, exactly. And he's got get, well, that's what our pipelines look like. Yes, it is interesting. They isn't do it? Yeah. look like that. So if you do a sketch of pipelines, oil and gas pipelines, and they're all flowing towards us. Yeah. So I think for me, it's like that makes no sense. Yeah. We should absolutely. We have forty percent of Europe's wind resource in this I'm country. Always like that. We've got 40% of Europe's wind. And I think yeah. I <laughs> add to that, personally. <laughs> oh, it's so important. So, yeah. yeah, I think it makes so much more sense to produce our own and now produce it cheap. Um, so something that I have noticed on your podcast, and mm-hmm. we are totally going to steal it, is environmental confessions. Yes. So things where we would like to be green and we are actually maybe not as good as we'd like to. So I'm, I'm curious to know yours. As a starting point. Well, I have to say, well, maybe I'm going to change that because I was just listening about the new car from Edinburgh. Is it from Edinburgh, the new car? It's Glasgow, but I saw it. The Munro, is it the Munro? You need a Munro. Yes, because I have to say, I do have a lovely Tesla, which wing mirrors froze this morning, very upsettingly. Um, But I have a backup car, which is, I have to say, a Jeep, diesel. And it's there because when I live on... It's a bit of a steep. I've been up it. Yes. It's quite a steep And, and also, <laughs> really don't want to take a rather expensive Tesla and lose it going down the hill into a Cotswold wall. So, yeah, I do have that. And, and also, you can tow with it. But this Munro sounds quite cool. It yeah. does. It can go up very steep inclines. I mean, uh, that's all I know. I'm not, I'm not technical, but uh, yeah, yeah, so super, I think that's the one for, one for you. Yeah. yeah, but that's my guilty secret. It sits on my drive. Don't use it very much, but I do have one. If I could do well, well, well you don't have to do I it. do. <laughs> so uh, mine is flying because I'm about to fly to Australia and it's going to be, you know, it's difficult. And I, have, I mean, I'm married to an Australian. I should not have fallen in love with an Australian. My children both have Australian passports. Have you told her that? They live there. Oh, many. She's told me <laughs> far more times. 
why did I marry a pom? <laughs> I think she says on a regular basis. But yeah, so flying, you know, and the fact that we still have done some flying, we've really, my goodness, we've cut mm. it down. So I think in 2019 and 2018, I flew an enormous amount for work, going to see cars, going to see things. And it was a lot of flying. And then obviously we all stopped flying, which was, and that was kind of a bit like the shock of stopping smoking. Yes. Once you stop, you go, oh, I don't really miss it now. Yeah, yeah. And then I definitely didn't miss it. And now I absolutely hate it. But, you know, but we have done it. So I've been to the States because of the American show. Mm. And now I'm going to Australia. Well, and we're doing the Australian show there, but it definitely is a, a So you're going to take a couple of solar panels on to, and slap them on the top as you're going along, maybe. What, on the plane? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hadn't thought of Is it okay if I open the door to put these solar panels on <laughs> while we're no, in I the think, middle of the... <clears throat> I think as the... the the sensible one, I should say, that our plan is to actually not go to the live shows abroad yeah. and have people out there doing that. So we've got people in those countries. Oh, fantastic. We're, we're on the route to not flying. Yeah, people talk, expect yeah. Robert at the launch events, so we send him to the launch events, but then uh, then it'll just be maybe, I don't know. Someone in a Robert mask. replacement. Virtual, virtual Robert. <laughs> yeah. Robert, yeah, Robert Clone. Well, like the ABBA show. I could be yeah. a, a yeah. hologram. You, you could interview yeah. lookalikes when you're over there. Yeah. No. <laughs> Most men who look like me are no. Let's not go there. Um, I suppose last question because I also noticed you haven't done your guilty thing. Oh, Dan okay. has done his. Come on, I've had to Good do point. it. Good yes. point. This won't make it into the edit, so yeah. <laughs> so whatever you like. Uh, I do have a bit of an addiction to Diet Coke in plastic <laughs> bottles, and every time I buy one, I feel bad. So that's mine. That's good. Just, just do, just put Robert's one in. I don't do anything bad. <laughs> Dan is absolutely. Dan is an angel. He is beyond approach, as no. his wife will absolutely confirm. Um, I guess last question because this is going to go out just before Christmas. Yeah. Um, I noticed that you have boxed wine. <gasps> oh, this is good. From a company called Yes Lalo. Yes, yes. So I read an article about this brilliant female startup company. Um, uh, talking about box wine. So box wine, when I grew up, we used to take to very bad parties and try to avoid drinking. And normally, you probably then pick it up, slightly vinegared, and then take it to the next one. Um, so box wine sort of has a bad, bad rap. reputation. Can I just quickly interrupt? What was it called? What's it called? Goon. In Australia, it's called <laughs> Goon. Mate, there's a gallon of Goon. I mean, you really, you know, you run it, you empty it down your toilet and it cleans the, <laughs> cleans the pipes. It was anyway, the idea of this is slightly different. So you, in a box, it's really neat because I keep looking at the size of the box and going, surely that's not three bottles of wine. But it is. They put in a little box that very easily fits in your fridge. And yeah, it's just beautiful. And it's fantastic local wines, small wineries across Europe where they've gone and researched it. It's just, it's brilliant. And I love stories like that where people have gone, I have a problem. I want to go and set up a business to go and sort out that problem. And that problem was drinking wine, and I quite like that. Yeah. And everyone should do that for their slightly lower carbon Christmas, I reckon. Yes, yeah. I reckon so as well. But also for a, a, a slow drinker like me, because I was told by a doctor to occasionally drink wine. Excellent. Make an effort, you know, which is quite <laughs> unusual go to your for, doctor for too, a man then. my age. But it, it's the amount of wine I've thrown away because it's gone off. Because yes. I've had a glass or maybe two glasses one night, and then it's really, and then you put it, in the bottle, you put the cork back in, like try and, and it's horrible, you know. Yeah. So to have some wine that would last longer is oh, it's brilliant. It's a fantastic. Big plus. I love yeah. it. Sorry, that's good. We don't give them a good plug. Yeah. Which <laughs> <laughs> sponsored by Lele. Yes. <laughs> Maybe we could have the wine show, the fully charged wine show. Oh. Well, we're doing we're doing a zero carbon kitchen at our, <gasps> our live shows. Oh, that's How true. excited! Can I come to oh, that and yes. drink wine? And can you? Just yes. Sit aside <laughs> drinking wine from a box. It's perfect. <laughs> Can I sit next to you? Yeah. We'll both be sloshed. Brilliant. Like, can you believe this is three bottles? I can't believe this. <laughs> I can't believe there were three bottles in there, Julia. I'm, I, it seems, it's empty. And it's 9.30 in the morning. <laughs> so, Julia, thank you so much for coming along today and joining no us on, on, this, on this new version of the Fully Charged podcast. We're very excited to have you. It's brilliant to catch up with you. We've got to do it again. Please come back. Please come to the Fully Charged live show next year. Can I drink wine? Can you bring like a wheelbarrow of boxes of wine? <laughs> yes. <laughs> It'd be great to see you there. And, okay. And good luck with all your unbelievable multitude of projects. Thank you but, so much. Okay. Lovely Please, to see you Please, big guys. round of applause for you. <laughs> that is special. I've got to admit, I'm a bit of a fan yeah. of Juliet. That, it was really interesting. She's amazing. Uh, but it's not the end. We've got a few minutes left, but before we finish... We've got the question of the week, exciting mm -hmm. competition, which I'm very excited about this. But we, we, before we announce that, 
we should say that what the prize is, Dan, because there's, pro there's actual proper concrete prizes. But we've got four tickets to Fully Charged Live to, to give away to a family or just an ordinary group of friends who like to, to look at electric cars and, and, and things. Uh, we've got some great shows planned next year, and we're working on all the content. The team are working on the content very hard. So we've got uh, Deborah Meaden doing an electric yes. fireside chat with you at, uh, at the Farnborough Can show. Can I just say I'm quite terrified of that, but I'm looking forward oh, to it too. She is a dragon, but I don't think she's looking to invest in you, so I think you'll be fine. Uh, we've got some exciting news about our zero-carbon kitchen, which I can't share right now, right. other than it's a... a an organization that's got a very, very good, uh, very top selling uh, vegan uh, cook cookbook. Uh, we're building an electric launch pad at most of the shows so we can bring some cars that have never been seen before yeah. as well. But each show is a little bit different, but we're working to make them all as good as we possibly can, starting with your trip to Australia, to, to, to next Australia year. And Sydney, which is I'm very excited about. And I've just been getting a lot, a lot of email about people coming to the show in, uh, in Australia. So we're looking forward to that. Yeah. So, what is the question? That's the thing. Well, We've got a question. Yes, yeah, so this question has come from Twitter, uh, from Mochman James, and it's, will the Japanese and German motor industry survive or disappear like British Leyland? Discuss. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. That's quite very specific, and I think probably accurately so, mm. that it's Japanese and German. So, you know, two of the absolute smash hit automotive manufacturers of the last, say, 50 years incredible turnaround you know how how successful they've been uh and then they're not really moving that quickly they are they're all making electric cars aren't they i think we can say even toyota now but not that many and not that they're not pushing it and china and i've got to say north american car companies particularly ford are doing proper actual big massive sort of restructuring of their whole business to produce electric vehicles well it differs from country to country i mean yeah. i would say ford of have got a good plan, a solid plan. They're investing Volkswagen, heavily. To be fair. GM probably a bit behind the curve. Yeah. But in terms of Japan, I mean, Nissan is still quite progressive. Yes, that's true. Um, but a few of the others, it feels like compliance. Yeah. So it's not, are they making them? It's how many? Yeah. And the Honda E is a fantastic car. We've talked Lovely. about that at length, but it's hamstrung by a short range, quite expensive. Yeah. And you wonder how motivated they are to sell tens of thousands yeah. uh, rather than, than hundreds. So I think the Japanese companies are under the spotlight and, and I think there could be some, some, some problems ahead uh, for the likes of Toyota who seem to be getting to the party uh, quite late really. And then in terms of the Germans, it's fascinating to watch them, I think, actually, because I know from statistics we've seen from the US and elsewhere that a lot of people are jumping out of BMW 3 Series right. and Audi A4s into Teslas right. and into Polestars. And you, mm. can, you can see see the appeal, don't they, can't you? So a lot of the, the German marks have started producing quite large premium yeah. SUVs. Um, and you do wonder if that strategy is gonna, gonna work for them. So I, I'm quite concerned for, for some of those companies, but I've always said it might not be that they disappear. It might just be they get bought by Chinese brands right. yeah. uh, and the Chinese actually use that brand and make those cars in, in China. But I mean, it is, yeah. I mean, I think it is, the more we see episodes coming in from Elliot the more you go oh this, this, these are these are really good cars I mean when you see how much those cars cost to buy on the road in China you know they are cheaper than, than anything we could have even imagine and they're obviously going to get more expensive when they come here they, the, the markup is <laughs> fairly eye-watering when they come to this to, to Europe but the fact is they can produce them at, in numbers today vastly outstripping anything that's happening in Europe or North America. I mean, that's shot, and Japan in particular, yeah. So a very good question that yeah. I think we could talk about for about an hour, but I yeah. think we're nearing the end of our time. I we think. are nearing the end of our time. Now you're right, Dan, because I would love to just waffle on for well, another let's do four that later. or five hours. <laughs> but I think we might lose our live audience here. because they, I, they like I think we lost them a while ago. I think we did. <laughs> but they've been... To, I want to give... The, I think we should give them a round of applause for listening to everything. Thank you very much. <laughs> really good of you to, to pop along today. And uh, that, I think that's it, really, isn't it? I think we can wrap it up here. So, you know, please do subscribe to the Fully Charged podcast. Please do tell your friends about it. I think that's the most critical thing. Spread the word. We're going to be doing more shows like this next year with amazing guests. Uh, but that's it. As always, if you have been, thank you for watching. Thank you very much.